thank you, Claire, and thank you to the Society for the invitation. I too acknowledge the Turrbal and Dungara people on whose lands we're gathered tonight. Now, in 2017, I holidayed in Italy for two months, a week in the northwest Italian Alps near the Swiss border in Valtelligio, famous for cheese, you might remember. Mm -hmm. And I spent one day only in Bergamo, which is a couple of hours of drive away from this beautiful place you can see on the screen, Val Rabi, an isolated valley in the central Alps near the border with Austria. It's north of Trento. I had no idea at the time that Val Rabi would soon exert a strange hold over me. On my return, here to Brisbane, I wrote some fiction and poetry inspired by the 2017 trip. But that was not the end of it. I would also publish a short biography in the Queensland History Journal about an Italian immigrant from the Trentino. Now that all began in 1982, when I participated in a project which aimed to produce a social history of the year 1938. Hundreds of oral histories, which aim to produce a social, um, sorry, hundreds of oral histories of ordinary Australians were collected nationwide as a contribution to Australia's bicentennial, bicentennial celebration in 1988. I conducted three interviews in central Queensland. Why central Queensland? Simply because I was born there and I knew that nobody else in the whole country would be doing interviews in central Queensland. <laughs> One of my subjects was Vi May O'Keefe, or Vi, as we called her. She was my Rockhampton interviewee. She was then 60 and married to a great uncle of mine. They married late in life. And since she boasted my father was Italian, and that's how she said it. And he mined gold and copper in Mount Morgan. I thought, perfect. So Vi was born in 1922, that's 100 years ago. And she began the interview talking about her father, although she didn't name him or her mother during the entire interview. And this is what she said. My father, who came from Italy, worked his way up through Australia and came up to Mount Morgan. There he met and married my mother. I don't know a lot about his background, because in those days, being of a different nationality, you didn't speak much of your own country. As we grew older and asked, he used to say, no, this is your country, this is my country. Other than that, we knew nothing only that he was the youngest of a large family, and the youngest boy of seven. He did enter the seminary for a while, but it wasn't his vocation. So he was sent out to this country sort of in disgrace. I think that's why he never kept in touch with them, his Italian family. And he came out, he was about 28, I think, when he came out to Australia. Well, 40 years after that interview, I revisited it. And I soon established that Vi's father was Fortunato Stablum, and he was born in 1885 in Rubby. Suddenly, Vi's father had not only a name, but a location. He came into focus as an Alpine man, born into summer pasture and deep winter snow, who would spend most of his working life in the underground gold and copper mine of fairly warm central Queensland, Mount Morgan. In the interview, Vi gave a thorough picture of her working class Roman Catholic childhood laced with nuns and convents. As for her own life, this is what she said. I was the third eldest and being the eldest girl well, in those days, you were just mum's hands. You helped. You were reared up as a family. Everyone had a certain little job. If there was a baby to be bathed and looked after, you did it. 
Throughout the interview, the parents loomed large in her life as mum and dad. But the search engine trove, the National Library of Australia's online portal, unearthed an earlier carnation of Fortunato Stadlin in his very first Australian workplace. It was Broken Hill in North New South Wales. Now the remote mining town is north of Adelaide and 700 miles west of Sydney. It must have been a stark contrast with his native homeland. Fortunato struck trouble in his second year there. He stood trial in July 1913. He was accused of taking a mattress from his the boarding house. The boarding house lady was Mrs. Soray of French background. The local paper, the Barrier Minor, used this heading: the lodger's mattress, a boarding house keeper's claim, an Austrian's English, quite the scandal. The newspaper mentioned Austrians because Fortunato's place of birth, Rabi, was until after World War I under Austro-Hungarian rule. Only when annexed by Italy <clears throat> in 1919 could the Austrians call themselves Italian without confusion. You might think the name Stavlum denotes Austrian ancestry, and perhaps it does. But Fortunato was always very clear. He always declared himself an Italian. This strange fact led me to find his arrival in Australia. He sailed from Genoa in a ship bound for Sydney, but disembarked in Port Adelaide in December 1911. Very easy to get from Port Adelaide to Broken Hill, straight up the centre. This is a fascinating document, The Passenger List. He describes his occupation as a miner. You can see his name just above that kind of crease in the middle. Um, and as you see, a number of others on that list do too. And they all happen to be from neighboring valleys uh, in Northern Italy. Lucia Pinassa, whose name is below his, was actually on her way to join her husband Giovanni, who resided in Broken Hill. Giovanni had established himself as a miner in Australia and had returned to his valley to marry. While there, he may have recruited Fortunato and the others to mine in Broken Hill. Fortunato's mining background in Italy is simply not known. Marble, gold, other precious things. We don't tend to think of mining and Italy together, but of course there is a lot of mining in Italy as there is in every place, but we simply don't know. But back to the trial in the Broken Hill Courthouse in 1913. It boiled down to a battle between the, good, the word of the good French women of Broken Hill and the word of the Italians. Fortunato's English was so rudimentary that the magistrate depended on assistance from an Italian interpreter. At midday, the Barrier Minor newspaper reported the hearing was adjourned by the magistrate to enable him to see the mat mattress itself. It was brought into the courtroom. At the sight of it, his landlady said it was hers, and that was that. He had to pay a fine. The experience might have inspired Fortunato, a miner with silver lead and zinc dust collecting in his lungs, to leave Broken Hill and to try and find his fortune elsewhere. How he got to Mount Morgan in central Queensland, we don't know, but by October 1916, with World War I aging, he was working for Mount Morgan Gold Mining. Being wartime, they were more interested in copper than gold. On arrival, Fortunato had to register at the police station as an alien. It would be a decade before he would apply for Australian citizenship. His physical description on that document was a short man with fair hair and gray eyes. He initially stayed in the Queensland National Hotel 
in the main street, which is only a short work, walk to the works, which is what the locals call the mine. He would have been in the Miners' Federation in Broken Hill, every man was, and he would have joined the Mount Morgan branch. With a steady job under his belt, Fortunato married Edith Hoare, a butcher's daughter. She was considerably younger, 15 years younger. Fortunato and Edith Stubborn welcomed their first daughter, Violet May, my interviewee, into their existing family of two boys, as I said, in 1922. Their next daughter, Rose, was born in 1925. Vi's memories are all of her mother, her first year in convent school, and the staunch Roman Catholic family life. The Miners' Federation did not win the 40-hour, five-day working week until 1938. So children did not generally see a great deal of their fathers. So what was Fortunato's, her father's working life like? He would have worked in a gang very much like this one. This photo is taken after a day's work underground in 1920. Note the range of ages in the gang. Some look extremely old to my mind. And of course, there's a very young boy in that group too. And this was a typical game. The work was backbreaking, the conditions difficult and often dangerous, with the ever present threat of injury and death. The physicality, the injuries, the mateship, the drama, and the heroism of a miner's life are all actually visible in this photograph. It's a very different experience, life under Earth, to life on Earth, as most of us are generally glad to be limited to. So 71 years, sorry, 701 years after Poet's death, can we not draw on the genius of Dante to interrogate the underground topography of mining in Australia? Remember all the action in his inferno his journey through hell, guided by the Roman poet Virgil, actually takes place underground. As Dante enters the gates of hell, he reads that famous inscription, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Pretty sure most miners found it pretty difficult to do that too. In Dante's work, underground is the realm of Satan. It's impotent, ignorant and full of hate, in contrast to the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving nature of God. As Virgil and Dante descend underground, the physical terrain they encounter is very much that of a miner, who enclosed by a rock in a space that may be as small as his own body, or if lucky, the size of a small room, must drill through rock faces, load rock into wagons, and transport it up to the surface for further treatment. He encounters what Dante does, quakes, tremors, dangerous gases, floods, rock falls, and fires, all in a day's work. And there's a very elemental aspect to this work. Earth, it must be fractured and sent to the surface, water, they must drink so they're not dehydrated. And also water can be a hazard because suddenly it can invade a shaft of the drilling. Air on which they're dependent for life itself can suddenly run out and cause suffocation. And fire can break out, at the best of times anyway. Sweating underground like that in small spaces is extremely hot. So the vul vulnerability of the physical body must be foremost in mind for the miner. To protect it, mental toughness is required to counter the horror of the dangers. And all of this activity happens in pitch black darkness, illuminated by flimsy lamp light and lights on headpieces. Dante describes nine levels of hell and isn't Botticelli's depiction here uncannily like 
the ever-deepening project of underground mining. It's interesting to note that Virgil asserts with reference to the sixth circle, that there are only two legitimate sources of wealth, natural resources, nature, and human labor and activity, art. God must therefore approve that a miner exploits natural and mineral resources using, using the power just of his own body. Of course, nowadays mining uh, to benefit just ordinary human activity is not so much to the fore, but massive profits for companies and shareholders. So it's a little more complicated than it was in Dante's time. The seventh circle, Dan, uh, Virgil explains, um, when they see lots of shattered stones all around them, resulted from a great earthquake that shook the earth at the moment of Christ's death. I think as I was preparing this talk, I started to get a glimpse of what it was really like to be a miner underground. It's easy enough just to think about it in passing, but to really understand what it was like for men like Fortunato, it's, um, it's quite confronting, even just to think about it. Anyway, miners the world over, regardless of religion or lack of it, needed to believe in a protector in this hellish workplace. There are a number of patron saints of mining, but St. Barbara is the most well known. We can imagine that Fortunato as a Roman Catholic may have prayed to her at the beginning of every shift. This particular framed lino print image of St. Barbara actually came from a, a miner's cottage in Gympie, which is another great Queensland mining town. The artist is unknown, but the style appears to be 1940s. Her importance continues into the 21st century. Kalgoorlie in the gold fields of Western Australia has an annual St. Barbara's Festival every December. It involves a parade down the main street to St. Barbara Square, which is affectionately known there as St. Barb's. <laughs> the festival incorporates a memorial service to commemorate those who have lost their lives in the mining industry. In 1927, when Fortunato was around 42 and his oldest daughter Vi only five, everything changed. The mining company experienced strikes and a fire and went into li liquidation. Mount Morgan's population was 16,000, but it looked set to become a ghost town. At the same time, the mining dust that had accumulated in Fortunato's lungs earned him a diagnosis of silicosis, a workplace-induced lung disease widely called, back then, the miner's disease or miner's tysis. His working life was over. He would need to collect a special pension to support his family. And for that, he would need Australian citizenship. His application for naturalisation to the Home and Territories Department on the 21st of November 1927 is in the National Archives of Australia. In working class towns like Mount Morgan, a sizable number of people were illiterate. Fortunato too would need the assistance of the local justice of the peace, who did the typing and the witnessing of the necessary documents. Fortunato signed in jagged black ink, clearly a man unaccustomed to writing in English. In many official documents, he is described as good at spoken English, but unable to write it. I noted a detail in the application that was my first signal that Vi had not told me everything about her family during my interview with her in 1982. And after all, why should she? Fortunato listed his four children as Thomas, 10, William, 8, Violet, five, and Charlotte Rose, two. Under Thomas's name, it was typed my adopted child, illegitimate child of my wife before she married me, legally adopted. The family secrets had come out in the archives. So Vi had died in 19, uh, sorry, in 2006, 
So I contacted by telephone another branch of the Stablum family. A descendant of William, Bill Stablum, advised that Bill's older brother, Tom, was actually indeed the son of a Mount Morgan miner called Tom Healy. Edith's parents had refused to let her marry Tom Healy, regarding him as a boozer. But back to Fortunato's struggle with minor's titus or silicosis. Dr. Bernardi was a revered doctor at the Mount Morgan Hospital in the early years of the 20th century. I don't know much about him, but it's interesting to know there is evidence that Fortunato was certainly not the only Italian in town. The doctor would have diagnosed many a case of lung disease. Silicosis is debilitating and deadly. When coal miners contracted, it's called black lung disease because the normally pink tissue of the lung turns black. Boom mining towns of 20th century Australia, like Mount Morgan and Broken Hill, were characterised by bands of brothers going down with this disease, man after man, generation after generation. In 21st century Australia, workers who cut up stone, the kitchen benches, get it. A sufferer can expect lungs filled with mucus, dreadful coughing fits, weight loss, and a strong, slow demise. Fortunato had given 16 years to, of worth of his labour to the Australian mining industry, a major personal contribution to the developing economy. And this slide shows how left-wing Sydney artist Noel Coonahan depicted the disease based on his study of coal miners in Victoria in 1945. The lino cut named The Cough is held in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. One of the things that strikes me about this is the strength of the man. He's muscular, his hand is big, but he is re reduced to you know, a cipher of a man through the disease. As Fortunato contemplated who would provide for his family of two boys and two girls and a much younger wife, we can imagine his fight to live and his decision to move them to more prosperous Rockhampton, some 30 kilometers northeast. Canberra posted the coveted naturalisation certificate to Mount Morgan in July 1928. That is a year and a half after he applied. And Fortunato, now 43, could move his family of six Australians to Rockhampton. Interestingly, um, they were not considered Australian because he was an alien until he naturalised the children born in Mount Morgan were not considered Australian. This is not all that different from how most countries run things, but it's still a shock. Um, anyway, he, as soon as his two sons were able to leave school, they would get jobs in Rockhampton and they would keep the family afloat. He did not know it then, but he had only seven more years to live. Church and uh, Rockhampton continued to be all important. Perhaps surprising for a man who said he'd left an Italian seminary for a more worldly life, but perhaps not if one imagines the drive to connect these two worlds, from seminarian to father of five. Five because in 1930 another son, Daniel, was born. Fry said in the interview, in our household my dad went to church more than my mum. So I guess that's because she had so many jobs to do. We all went to mass every Sunday morning and every day for the week of Easter. Fortunato Stablum's Rockhampton years weren't limited to family, church and vegetable garden. He was a staunch labor man, apparently. He enjoyed card games, but was not a drinker. In my whole life, even at Christmas time, I said, I've only ever seen my father take two glasses of beer. His sobriety would have contributed to the family's survival. Destitution generally resulted when a provider was a problem drinker. 
However, Fortunato may have felt a loneliness that his daughter missed. This is how she put it. We never learned any Italian from my father. I only ever heard him speak his native tongue once. We were at a church celebration and the bishop could speak fluent Italian. Once you spoke to dad, you knew he was Italian by his accent. And him and the bishop, well, they must have chatted on. He was really happy to find someone in his own country, someone of his own country to speak with. But what that conversation was about, I don't know, because I couldn't speak Italian. And that was the only occasion he did in her memory of it. I found that a very moving part of her interview, especially when she said the word happy. I tried to reflect that. <coughs> she really reflected her father's happiness. He was really happy to find someone. I found that very moving. Fortunato succumbed to lung disease around Christmas 1935. Born in 1885, he died at 50. The family he left behind consisted of wife Edith, 35, and children Tom, 18, Bill, 16, now both with jobs, Vi, 13, Rose, 10, Dan, 10, Dan, 5, Patty, 1, and a newborn, John, six weeks old. All of those children have passed on, the most recent just a few days ago. Well, mining made widows and fatherless children by the score in Australia at the time. Fortunato was a member of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, a fellowship that believed in brotherhood and helping those with misfortune. They took a special interest in um, fatherless children and tried to help them get an education. The Wakanton Society called on its members to attend their brother's funeral. This post is from the mining town of Queenstown in Tasmania. Two years later, Edith, mother of seven, married that Mount Morgan miner, Thomas Healy, in February 1936. And yes, this is the man who Edith had fallen pregnant to at 16, and the natural father of her oldest son, Tom. I don't know if you can see uh, the picture of, uh, it's Noel Cunahan again, part of his series of the, goal, of the coal miners in Victoria in 1945 that he did. That one is called um, The Wife. And uh, every mining town understood that, they, uh, that um, accidents or whatever could cause uh, a woman to become a widow quite young. Well, Vi did not tell me any of that. Um, after all, she was only 13. And to help the family, she was actually about to leave school and work in a news agency. Instead, she had vaguely created the impression to me that her Italian father was actually the father of 12. She failed to pinpoint his death. She did not mention the existence of a stepfather let alone that he had fathered uh, the next six children, at least half of the tribe she was describing. <laughs> the newly wed Healy couple put the three youngest Dublin children into the local near coal orphanage run by Roman Catholic nuns, keeping only the newborn John, who was raised as John Healy. The Dublin children were not released until their teens. The five children that Vi helped raise after her father's death were all the offspring of her stepfather, Tom Healy, while three of the siblings that she'd helped so much with before his death were banished to the orphanage, out of sight and out of mind. It must have been traumatic. Perhaps that is why she would not speak about it to me. But we must remember too, that it was immensely challenging for working class people to survive with dignity in the early decades of the Australian nation. 
Well, it is a sombering end to this brief biography of Fortunato, but it does add to our understanding of the realities of Italian immigration as it intersected with Australian mining history. I'd like to just toast Fortunato and his descendants. Thank you. <laughs> Questions are most welcome. Thank you. I think one thing that's really interesting is that what, what, what was the name of the leader's parents were happy for her to marry a spoken Italian man rather than the, the, the Irish also do so. I think that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. They were happy to get such a Yes. Uh, in case that didn't get picked up by um, the microphone here, the question was, or oh, comment really, that um, wasn't it interesting that this young woman, Edith's parents, were keener for her to marry this hardworking Italian and the boozy reputation that um, Tom Healy uh, had. Um, and I thought that was interesting too. And uh, she was very young and uh, it is something that the family said was that as she was under age, really, she wasn't, uh, her parents could decide whether she was old enough to marry or not. So they decided that uh, he was not the right partner for her. Oh, was she? she was only 16. Yeah. But, um, Although Vi did prove to be an unreliable narrator, you could say in some instances, what I really did pick up from her was the happiness of their family life. And uh, although she didn't talk about the tropes we usually think of with Italian family life, like the big you know, feasts or the food or anything, um, I did find it interesting that she mentioned that Fortunato, uh, she didn't name, but dad, uh, had a big vegetable garden. And so hidden amongst her uh, interview, there were things that really did stand out to me and really identified her father as Italian and the vegetable garden was one. I found that comment too, that um, dad went to church more than mum, rather interesting in the light of certain facts later on. But um, I was adamant that the family was extremely religious all the way through. Thank you for that question. That's a really interesting observation. I have a question. Uh, the Bishop of Rockhampton, at that time, could he possibly have been a Bishop then, Bishop James Dewey? I have no idea. Because he was the Bishop of Rockhampton before he became the Bishop, the Archbishop of Brisbane. And most people, most priests who became bishops were sent to Rome to study. So it could very well have been him. Yes. yes. We were just talking about the identity of the bishop in 1930s, um, yes. in the 1930s. Well, it was sure to have been him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Archbishop Joy uh, also um, was very conscious about the difficulties that were being experienced by Italians in North Queensland, the animosity towards them, and um, he encourage some of them not to go to North Queensland and to go to Stanford. It's written in several pieces I've read as being a supporter of Italians and migrants in Australia. Yes, well, thank you. That comment, for those who didn't pick it up on the mic, was that um, Bishop Dewey was uh, very aware of the animosity to North Queensland um, Italian immigrants and he encouraged them to go to Stanford and other more friendly places. Uh, can I just add something? Yes. I can back up um, uh, Archbishop Dewey or Bishop Dewey's um, support for migrants because um, I went to school here in Brisbane at Kalinga uh, near Woolworth and uh, Archbishop Dewey had brought in 
uh, American nuns, an order fully of Polish origin, so all of them could speak Polish and fluent English, English mostly born in America, I think, uh, in order to teach Polish to the children of the migrants and in order to be able to um, uh, speak to the parents in Polish about their children. So a very interesting man. Interesting. Uh, just a comment about maybe racial harmony in um, Mount Morgan I'd like to make. Because they were my and they were all unionised, there was a deal between people. That's not to say there weren't feuds and fights and just of it, but um, mining towns do have a, a really strong sense of brotherhood. Uh, and the women are very, very much uh, supportive of one another too. So I happen to know a lot about Mount Morgan growing up in the 50s. My grandmother lived in Mount Morgan. And of course, she knew my interviewee. She became a sister-in-law of this interviewee, but she knew her well before that anyway. And um, there was still a lot of vestiges of that culture then. You know, the taking of soup to the old and afflicted, um, just the kindness that people would show, the need to know who you were. I think I was even put in the Mount Morgan newspaper for being in town visiting my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that's the kind of connections that, that happen there. And another thing I'd like to mention, you didn't mention in the talk, was um, down there in this hellish realm of dark, hot underground, um, people really depended on each other uh, for their very lives. So a lot of smaller and trivial issues tend to go by the by when that's known between people. And another wonderful factor down underground was the horses. There were pit ponies, and these pit ponies were very important to the workers. Uh, any other comments or questions? I've, I've asked, I've put on the chat there, if anybody in Zoom wants to ask a question, you can either type it into the chat or unmute yourself and call out loudly so we can hear you. But I, I've got one while I'm up here, Leslie. Um, you said that he, that Fortunato didn't have any contact with his family back in Italy after he migrated, which is quite an unusual situation. Mm. Do you know any more about that? Or can you tell us? Yes, I don't know any more about that. Mm. It does make me wonder whether he had a, a, an interesting past he was leaving behind. Um, but um, one thing I did find by talking to another branch of the family who had done quite a lot of family history, um, and I'm not related to him in, in at all by blood. So, you know, I would not want to kind of pry too much into the family history, but this was so fascinating that um, apparently there were seven brothers. Some went to America, United States, some went to Australia. So apparently he actually had brothers in Australia according to the family. But very interestingly, he had a brother called Emmanuel who became a doctor, probably one of the older um, brothers for whom education might have been more affordable. This doctor in Rome is said to have saved the lives of 52 Jewish people from the Nazis and is named on an honour board. Because I hadn't done any research into this myself, I'm you know, not, not saying that this is absolutely definite, you'd have to research this. But when I heard that, I found that absolutely fascinating and the contrast between that life and uh, the much harder life that um, Fortunato happened to have uh, really did stand out to me. But I do believe he had a, happy, had a happy life with his children and family. He was not to know what would happen in the future. Um, you know, that would have been heartbreaking, of course, to realise that his children were put in an orphanage by the very man whose child he looked after. But um, he, he did seem to have a happy family life. Um, from what I could make out. He certainly stuck with that family because I mean, plenty of men didn't. Uh, he stuck with that family and um, seemed to be very thoughtful about things for them, such as, well, the mine's closed, we're going to Rockhampton. I'm, I'm on my way out, but I'm going to make sure I set you up as well as possible. 
And he was obviously a great believer in the church and he felt that, um, you know, Christianity was, was going to help them all a great deal. So there were things that I sort of felt about him that you could feel through the lines of the interview. And um, in the end, I felt in a way quite close to this person. <laughs> I think um, Eric has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Leslie, yeah. Leslie um, did, did you get a, an idea if there was a strong Italian community in Mount Morgan or Broken Hill in some places? Because even today in Broken Hill, there's lots of different uh, nationalities working in the mines. There's a great question about whether uh, there were a, an Italian community in Mount Morgan. I think other historians now might have to follow that path and find out. It seems to me that surely he would have come all the way from Broken Hill to Mount Morgan with at least another person. But uh, no, there, it's, Mount Morgan is not known for having a strong um, Italian community at all. But I bet there's a little bit more of the story mm. there yet to be told. Thanks for that question. Thank you. I think Helen has one too. I can see her hands up. Would you like to ask your question, Helen? She's got a... Hi, Les. Hi, this is my cousin, by the way, up there in Mount Morgan. <laughs> it's good. It's, it's uh, lovely to, to um, listen in, Les. Um, I always spoke well of a dad, um, being a good provider and a hard worker um, and, and being Catholic most of our, our family is, I just sort of wonder, that must have been pretty hard, you know, to have have a child that wasn't his, to take it on in those tough times, uh, money-wise, you know, um, and um, a lot of people just would have hidden hidden that fact. And I suppose that's why Vi didn't speak about it. She grew up in a different era to, to what we grow up into now. But, but thank you, it's been lovely to uh, to listen to it. Thank you, Helen. Yes, I really do agree that um, what does come through about him is that hard work, that staunchness with family. And, um, and it is, when you think about it, completely understandable that Vi did not tell that story. But I feel like I'm at, being somewhat of a historian like I have to tell that story. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. But uh, of course, she would not want me to be telling that story. Um, but yes, it really does show that uh, Fortunato did not shirk from his uh, obligations. Like as soon as he took something on, he, 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 he kept with it. Well, thanks for listening in. I think you're my only Mount Morgan um, Zoom attendee. <laughs> 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 thanks, Liz. <laughs>